I'm 21 years old now. This happened to my uncle when I was around 9 years old. My uncle was living in our house and was staying at our vacant guest room up on the second floor. He's my dad's cousin, so he was really close to our family. My uncle was a morning person. He would always get up at around 4 a.m., drink coffee, and run morning errands around the house. He also told us that he could see and feel ghosts because he has a third eye. And to give you a little background on our house, it was the very first house that was built on our street. We could sometimes feel something moving around our house, especially at night, but we never really paid attention to it. One morning, my uncle woke up at his usual time, around 4 a.m. He left his room, which was right beside the staircase, saw my older sister, who was 17 years old at that time, going up the stairs with a cup of coffee in her hand. The weird thing was, he said that my sister was looking down and not showing her face the whole time. He greeted her with, good morning, and why are you up so early? He said my sister just kept walking up while looking down and ignoring him. My uncle felt awkward as my sister just walked past him. He ignored it, thinking my sister was in a really bad mood. He thought she probably stayed up late studying or something. My uncle went down to grab a cup of coffee when he saw my mother in the living room, ironing some clothes. My uncle was confused about why my mother was up at 4 a.m. and ironing clothes. He tried to talk to her and asked the same thing he asked my sister. Why are you up so early? He noticed that my mother was wearing the same clothes from the night before she went to bed, so he knew it was her. To his surprise, my mother ignored him. My mother never ignored anyone, which is why he found it strange. My mother was just looking down as she kept ironing. That's when my uncle knew something was off. He knew something was very wrong here. He rushed back upstairs to his room, locked the door, turned off the lights, and tried to go back to sleep. He tried to forget about it and woke up again a few hours later. It was around 10 a.m. in the morning when he talked to my mother and my sister about what happened. They said they were asleep the whole night, and they don't recall waking up at 4 a.m. My uncle was so shocked about what he had just experienced. Someone was copying my mother and sister earlier that morning. I was so scared at that time. I became so paranoid that I might feel or see something odd in our house, but I tried not to think about it too much. The night after that situation, my uncle woke up at around 3 a.m., he felt something at the end of his bed, and he saw a woman with long hair sitting there. My uncle froze for a while. He didn't know what to do. He was trembling when he said, Go away! My uncle hid under his blankets. After a few minutes, which felt like hours, he looked at the same spot where he saw the woman, and she was gone. My uncle slept with the lights on that night. After that experience, he thankfully didn't experience anything like it ever again. One day, I was on my way back from a school party. I was with my friends, but please keep in mind I was only 20 years old. We were drunk, so we really didn't know where our Uber driver was taking us. He took us through this road called Sonol in California and everyone in the car knew this road had a very upsetting story behind it. We didn't care, since we were all drunk, and it was 3 a.m. We just wanted to go home. At what seemed like the end of the ride, the driver stopped at the side of the road and let in this girl. She sat in the back seat of the car. She claimed her name was Mary. All of our hearts dropped when we saw she had a dress on. It was a white dress. She also claimed that her husband dumped her on her wedding night. She said she was trying to find a ride for three hours, but she couldn't since it was too dark outside. When I got a good look at her, I was shaking because she was tearing up blood. I whispered to my good friend Dominic. I told him about the Bloody Mary story. I told him that it took place on this very road and that the girl might be a ghost. Right as I finished that sentence, she looked at me through the rearview mirror with her bright, white eyes, 
and asked us if we were talking about her. My heart dropped once again. We asked the guy to pull over, but he insisted on dropping us off at our location. One of my female friends in the car started crying after Mary started reciting all of our names from the back of the car. We were scared because we didn't tell her our names. Now everyone in the car was crying except for me. It felt like we were driving forever, but it had only been 10 minutes. It got brighter out, and we realized that no one was in the back. It was a night spirit that was there, and it left because it was now morning. The next morning, I thought about what happened while I was taking a shower. When I looked in the mirror, I saw a scratch on my neck. When I was eight years old, I used to live in my grandma's house in Ecuador. Many of the neighbors would talk to my parents about seeing weird stuff in the house, like shadows moving around the windows when we weren't home. The first thing that would come to our heads was that someone must have broken into the house, but nothing would ever be missing. Of course, they didn't think that there was someone breaking in. They were sure that our house was haunted. Everyone even refused to come inside for parties or any other special occasion. They told us to get a priest and to get rid of any bad spirits. We didn't take their warnings as something important because my parents don't believe in those kinds of things. Although I would hear someone going up the stairs at night, our stairs were really old, so they would make a loud sound when someone would step on them. However, when I checked, there was nothing. I would just run to my bed and cover my head with the sheets until I fell asleep. One night, someone started knocking on the door really hard and screaming. We got really scared as it was 12.30 a.m. and everyone was asleep by then in our neighborhood. It was extremely rare that someone would be up at that time. My dad took his shotgun and told my mom and me to stay in my room and not move. I was scared for my dad's safety, but I felt relieved when my dad said my neighbor's name. He informed us that a water pipe had broke in our backyard and the water was spraying his house and broke one of his windows. He was nice about the situation and even said he'd help us fix the pipe. My dad got the shovels, as the pipes were underground, and we had to dig to see what was wrong and how we could fix it. As we started digging, they realized that they needed other materials, and they went to get it, leaving me alone in the backyard. There was barely any light back there. The only source of light we had was the moon, and one light post a block away from my house. I was pissed off. I mean, how could they leave an eight-year-old boy there by himself in the dark? But I didn't say anything about it. About ten minutes had gone by since they left, and I was wondering what was taking them so long. They were only getting some materials after all. But as I was going to go back inside, I saw something moving really fast at the corner of my eye. I froze. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. I wanted to scream. But I couldn't. All I could do was move my eyes. I started to freak out, looking around to see what the hell was running around me. I didn't see anything. It was as if there was nothing there at all. But then I looked to my right, and I saw something that haunts me to this very day. It was a demon, in my opinion. It was so tall, around seven or eight feet tall. It had long, skinny legs with a really buff body. It also had very long spiral horns, and his eyes shined in the dark. I still couldn't move. The thing ran by me, looked at me, but it didn't do anything to me. It just looked at me. It could have been a goat or a sheep. I've never seen one so big or one that walks on two legs like a human. It ran, and I hid behind a big tree by my neighbor's house. <sighs> Finally, I could move. I yelled at the top of my lungs while crying hysterically. My dad came running with his shotgun in hand and asked me what was wrong. I explained what I saw to him, but he didn't believe me, nor did my mom. But someone did. My neighbor told me that he thought nothing happened to me because I'm a kid. As time passed, I slowly got over it. I moved from that house and moved to New York. My grandparents sold the house and I left that experience in the past. However, that's not where this story ends. In my sophomore year in high school, 
I had a nightmare. The thing that I saw that night was in it this time. I could only see its head as it was hiding behind the big tree. He said three words that'll haunt me until my time comes. It said, you can't hide. I woke up from my nightmare and headed to school. While in school, at around 12.30 p.m., there was an announcement. A classmate of mine had been killed in front of my school by a car without brakes. I turned pale as I thought my nightmare may have something to do with the incident. I was scared and even went home early. I told my parents about it, but this time they took me to a priest and he said he'd give me something in three days. Every single day I had the same nightmare until my priest gave me a blessed cross and I haven't had any nightmares about the thing anymore. However, every night I sleep with the covers over my head. Call me a coward or anything you want, but the thing still hasn't left my mind. Those three words haunt me till this day, making me wonder when I will forget or move on from the thing. About 10 to 12 years ago, I was a drug addict living in Cleveland, Ohio. I usually spent my days smoking, drinking, and I was usually up to no good. I would go with whoever had the drugs, basically. One day, my friend and I were talking with this guy, and he said he had some dope on him, and he invited us to his house. It wasn't the first time I've seen him invite women over to his house to smoke and do other drugs. He seemed nice, but I didn't feel comfortable going with him, but I was. Then I saw another friend across the street, so I went over there to her. After that, I went home, and my friend went with him. The next day, his house was surrounded by police and news cameras. I didn't know why, but my friend ended up telling me that when they were in his house, this guy, Anthony, punched her in the back of her head and started to choke her. Then she woke up in a bed. She said next to the bed, she saw a woman's body with no head attached, but she decided not to scream because he was asleep right next to her. She ended up crawling and getting out of the house, literally running out of the house, barely clothed, and ended up calling the police. Eventually, they found 11 bodies of 11 different women in and around his house. Who would have known that man was a serial killer? His name was Anthony Sowell. I'm so glad that my other friend caught my attention right before I was going to his house. Who knows? I could have been one of those bodies. A few years back, I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently bought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't find a buyer, so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I realized there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was about 45, but looked much older. She would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep, so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down. She opened her door and I got a quick peek. Her walks all had crosses painted on them in different colors, and words like Jesus and Angel scribbled everywhere. The windows were painted black, letting in no light at all. It was damp, yellow-stained 50-year-old carpets, dog shit and cockroaches everywhere. No dog though. I asked her to please keep it down. She just looked at me and shut the door. Then she turned up the radio even louder. The next day I had my girlfriend staying over. I wake up in the middle of the night and see a shadow of a person next to the bed looking at us sleeping. I think I'm hallucinating as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy. But then the shadow starts talking. It's my neighbor and she's holding something in her hand. 
She broke in during the night, and who knows how long she stood there. You should lock your door at night, she says and walks out. The next morning, I hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It's my neighbor, talking to herself in tongue. She has a plastic bag in her hand, with her rotting, dead dog inside. It's hot as hell outside, and I can smell death from the bag. At this point, I'm scared shitless. She's obviously very insane. I go upstairs and knock on another person's door and ask what the hell is going on. The guy is as scared as me. Apparently she broke into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching TV with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack, only to find her behind the couch staring at him, holding a power drill. At this stage, I'm basically shitting myself. I call the cops and they know all about her. Apparently she's a violent schizophrenic and she hasn't taken her meds, but they can't force her or enter her apartment without permission because she owns it. The only thing they can do is get her when she goes outside. I sit up for the next two days waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I hear her leave at 2 a.m. to go across the road to the 7-Eleven, I call the cops. They have three cars and a special van over in less than two minutes. They restrain her and throw her in the van and drive off to some institution. And in less than a minute, it's like she was never there. I never see her again, but I still have nightmares about her looking at me in my sleep. I was a total video game addict. I would play it from day till night. Of course, my mom hated the fact that I always focused on games and not so much on the important stuff. She would always hide my phone so that I wouldn't be able to use it. Every time she confiscated my phone, I was swallowed by boredom. I didn't have anything to do when I couldn't play. Sometimes, if I had free time, I would try to find the spot where my mom hid my phone. But I always failed. But the only thing I knew for sure was that she hid my phone in one specific room. A room with a lot of cabinets filled with stuff and junk, which made it really hard to find my phone. One day, when my mom hid my phone again, I suddenly came up with an idea. I asked myself why I hadn't thought of secretly recording her to see where she hid my phone so that when she was finally done hiding it somewhere, I could go inside and watch the footage. Then, I could finally get my phone back for good. So, I finally got my phone back, mainly because I needed it for means of communication while in school. Once I got home, I purposely made my mother annoyed until she confiscated it from me. And that's exactly what she did. But before she confiscated it, I quickly put the camera inside the room when she didn't notice. I put the camera in the corner of the room so that I could see everything. I was really excited to know where her secret hiding place was. Finally, she came out of the room, which meant she finished hiding it. When she was finally gone, I went inside the room and grabbed my camera. I quickly played the video. At first, I looked at the duration of the video. It was seven minutes long. It must have taken a lot of time for her to hide it. I started to skip until I could see my mom inside the room. I skipped for about six minutes, but she still wasn't shown on the screen. I was confused, but I told myself that maybe it happened in the first three minutes and I missed it. I went to the beginning of the footage again, but failed to find it. 
I was growing impatient. I played the whole video even though it was long. I finally reached the last few minutes of the video, where I went inside the room to get the camera, but my mother was still not shown. I was really confused. Why wasn't she in the video? But I was clearly in the video when I came in to get the camera. I was getting pretty scared at that point. In person, I saw my mom enter and exit the room with my own two eyes. Maybe the camera failed to capture it, but that's impossible. My mom noticed that I was quieter than before. I was stressed and my eyebrows were furrowed. My mom asked me what was wrong. I got my camera and showed her the footage. I explained it to her as well. She said that maybe the camera cut out the footage, but something was really wrong here. I asked her if she did in fact enter the room and of course she answered yes. I felt goosebumps all over my skin and I was still confused. This might not be the best scary story I have, but it is still running through my mind. What happened? Why is my mom not in the footage? The thing is that in the video, the door opened, but my mom wasn't in the footage. That's the scariest part. When I was around 14 years old, I always went on the internet, and I had this app called Discord. After a while of having Discord, I met a boy named Luke. We started talking for a while, and one day, he asked me what I looked like. Without thinking, I sent him a picture of me. He told me that I was beautiful and that he loved my long, dark hair and how I did my eyeliner. I just said thanks, thinking nothing of it. Around a week later, he told me that he loved me, and I felt the same way about him. We had so much in common. Luke was very good-looking, too. He had a different style from normal people. He wore a mask and always wore the color black. A while later, I realized it started becoming too much for me. He would always ask me personal questions like where I lived, and I told him I lived in California. He also lived in California and said he wanted to run away and meet me. He said that our relationship was going to get real. We kept talking every day, and he got so overprotective and would text to me every few minutes. One day, I was home alone because my parents were on a trip to celebrate their 20th anniversary. I didn't mind until it became nighttime. It was so dark outside, and it gave me the chills. I decided to close all the windows and make sure that the doors were locked. I sat in my living room and watched some TV. After around 20 minutes, I heard a knocking sound coming from the window behind me. I realized I didn't pull the blinds over it and that some kids were probably playing tricks on me. I got up and went to the window. As I got closer, my heart kept beating faster and faster. I looked out the window and no one was there. So I just closed it with the blinds and sat back down. After that, I got a message from Luke. He said, let's meet up now. I told him I was busy and that I couldn't, but he said that I wasn't and that he could see me. I felt so afraid and told him to stop scaring me because I was home alone, which I really shouldn't have told him. I asked him how he knew where I lived, and he told me that he looked on Snapchat and found my exact location so he could meet up with me whenever he wanted. I was so afraid. I heard a knock on the door, and a teen boy's voice tell me to open the door. It sounded so attractive, and I knew that it had to be Luke. I stayed still and didn't know what to do. I was home alone and no one could defend me when I'm alone. I texted him and told him to leave me alone now. 
Luke knocked again and said he wasn't going to leave. I finally got up and opened the door. There he was, standing there, ever so tall. He smiled and bit his lip and invited himself in. I told him several times to leave, but he didn't listen. Then he went quiet, and I tapped his back. He ripped his mask off to reveal all the scars he had around his lips. I froze in shock and told him to please leave, now. I was so angry, I didn't even care. Then he smiled creepily and ran downstairs to the kitchen and I ran after him. He was holding a knife and then ran after me. I ran outside, hid in the bushes, and called 911 as fast as I could. The police arrived quickly. They found him. But what was even more creepy was that he smirked at me when they took him into their car. I called my parents shortly after and told them everything and they came home. I never want to stay home alone again. It creeps me out. I deleted Discord and blocked him before I did. Having an internet boyfriend will haunt me forever. And I will never forget the creepy smirk he gave me. Back when I was 21 years old, I was a strategic firearms commander. This meant that I led a team into dangerous situations that oftentimes involves hostages or civilians who carried guns or other deadly weapons. I had a second-in-command firearms commander working beside me. His name was Callum, and he was my best friend. We always hung out outside of work. While on duty, he would always joke around and make us crack a smile, even when we were dealing with pretty distressful stuff. We once had a case where a man had possession of a firearm, and we were assigned to take care of it. Callum seemed particularly eager and jumped out of the van before it even came to a full stop. When the rest of the team reached the scene, the man was already shot. Callum still had the gun in his hand. Soon after, I asked Callum why he was so eager to do it. And then he said he had no specific reason. He was just excited. I believed him because he was my best friend. Later on, when I was looking at the man who was shot, I looked him up on social media and realized that he and Callum added each other on Facebook. Upon further investigation, I realized that there were thousands of messages sent between the two where Callum revealed sensitive information about several operations. I knew that he killed this man on purpose, but I had no way of proving it. He was taken to court and was sentenced to three years in jail for perverting the court of justice. I testified against him and was no longer his friend. When I was 24 years old, I was still on the firearms team. All that happened with Callum was behind me and I was happy with my life. One night I went home really late after work. As I walked to my apartment, I realized that it was trashed. I called the police and they reported it, but there was not much they could do because I didn't have a CCTV. As I got into bed, I saw that there was a note on my bedside table. All it said was, remember me? I instantly recognized Callum's handwriting. And now that he was out of prison, I thought that he would move on with his life. I was so wrong. This was his revenge. The next day, I went to the underground parking lot and I saw that my windscreen was smashed. It was clear that he wasn't over me testifying against him. Soon after, I also saw him near my apartment. I ran after him, but he ignored me and ran away. I tried calling his old number, but it was no longer in service. Then an envelope was sent through my door, and it contained hundreds of photos of me at work, home, and even out with my girlfriend at clubs and restaurants. These were all taken very recently. The last one, though, was a picture of Callum and I from years ago, and on the other side, written with a big red marker were the words, You're dead. I reported this as stalking and hoped he would end up back in prison. The police had gone to his listed address, but there was no one there. In fact, all of his bags were packed. I knew he was still in the area somewhere, though. One day I was by myself in an unmarked car, and I saw this Toyota Yaris, and it was driving close behind me. It was my gut instinct to get the plate number checked, and I was going to. 
But then I got a priority one announcement on the radio saying there was a crazy man on a bus who had a knife and stabbed someone. I turned on my sirens and blue lights and headed to the accident. As I got on the bus, he was already arrested, and the ambulance was already there as well. As I was about to leave the bus, I heard a loud bang, and a man on the bus fell down. He was shot through the window by a man who was wearing a black hoodie. He immediately ran. I ran out of the bus and went to the boot of my car. I got my MP5 SF out, which was a large rifle with sniper capabilities. I ran after the suspect and radioed in. They gave me an order of critical shot, which meant I could shoot to kill the suspect. He ran through the town center and went to the left. I was worried about public safety as he had a large rifle as well. I realized instead of running after him, I needed to get on a roof and shoot down. I went to this building that had views of the right and left. It took me five minutes and I was worried that he would have run away by now. As I got to the roof, I turned my gun to the sniper level. I used the eyepiece to scan and I saw a man in a black hoodie running. I fired a shot and he fell to the ground. By the time I got there, more armed policemen came to the area. I was shocked to see Callum. He was the one who followed me in the car behind me, and that shot in the bus was meant for me. But he missed. Callum was dead. I felt sad, but also relieved that this was all over. The man shot in the bus survived, and I was promoted for my diligent work. I'm still working in the force. This happened to me in the 1970s. To be exact, it was November 23rd, 1971. I was 20 years old at the time and was really down on my luck. I was living in Portland, but I'm from Seattle and I'll be going home very soon. I had lost my job and was about to be evicted from my apartment because I couldn't pay the rent. I will be flying back home to stay with my parents until I could find a new job or somehow get the money for my apartment which would be very unlikely. I had one night left in my apartment before leaving. I didn't feel like staying home, so I decided to go for a walk and have a drink in a bar. On my way to the bar, I stopped at a convenience store and purchased a lottery ticket. I walked down the street and entered a nearby bar, where I ordered myself a beer. Not long after that, a man came inside and sat next to me and ordered a drink. We got to talking about life and just general conversation when he mentioned he was going to a flight the next day to Seattle. I laughed and asked him, wait, flight 305? He laughed and said, yeah, that's the one. He asked me why I was heading there. I told him I had money troubles and coincidentally, he said the same thing. He seemed like a nice guy. We talked for about another hour before he decided to call it a night. Unfortunately, I never called his name. I was about to leave the bar myself shortly after that when I heard over the TV that the lottery numbers would be announced. I decided to stay and check if I had won. Why not? And would you believe it? I won. $15,000. Of course, I was beyond belief with shock. And of course, I wouldn't need to go back home because I had money now. The next day, I saw something on the news that a flight had been hijacked, and the plane was being held at ransom. It was the same flight I was going to be on, and I couldn't believe it, but the sketch of the guy they described who took the flight hostage was the exact same man I had been talking to in the bar. He used the name D.B. Cooper. If you didn't know, he threatened to explode the plane with a bomb unless he got $200,000, which he did then jumped out of the plane with the money and parachute and was never seen again. I didn't know why, but I never said anything to anyone. Even if I could, it's not like I knew his real name. It was such a scary coincidence that the only thing that stopped me was the reason why I was in that predicament anyway. I needed money and then I got some. It's strange how everything works out in life.